trying to figure when, when it was. Maybe five years ago, we stopped at this tree and I had a bunch of children measure it. And I showed people that, generally speaking, whenever I ask people how old they think a big tree is, they give me a number that's like way, way too high. And I asked people how old they thought this tree was and everyone was saying like 150, 200 years old. And I, for, fortunately, my guess was really close. I said it was between 100 and 120 years old. And we used a specific measurement for white oaks, which we have more information on. Generally, the formulas people use are not that great. Um, but the white oaks, when well, we can get good measurements of, and it came out at, I think, 112 years old. So maybe now it's 116 years old. So one thing I wanted to do now while we're here um, is like, is talk about the merits of a 116 year old tree and what it, what it is doing and what it isn't doing. So the most important thing is what is it not doing that us, a 50 year old white oak would be doing. It's not a trick either. You got, you all know this, is but it, it's not rhetorical. I'm asking. Is it still producing increments? Good. Proper. No, probably not. It's probably dropping very few. So when I was at Swarthmore, we had remnant populations of Southern Red Oak, Black Oak and White Oak, all with no recruitment, no young oaks coming up of those species anywhere. And that's not just because the deer are eating them all, you know, it's because they're literally not producing more. So this White Oak right over here um, is, even though it's about the same height, is probably less than half of the age of this one. Um, and is probably producing acorns. So generally also people get confused about the term mast. And I always try to tell people what a mast deer really is. And it has to do with understanding well, soft and hard mast and then with oaks, white and red oaks. So the white oaks, they drop their acorns every year. And the red oaks drop their acorns every year also. But it takes red oaks a year and a half for them to, for their acorns to grow. So they sometimes have heavier years, but the white oaks also sometimes have heavier years. <laughs> and this is why the chestnut was such a good tree because it, it would produce reliably every year, great nuts. Whereas a lot of the other trees can be confusing or you have to wait 40 years for an oak or a hickory to start making fruit. So even though this is a, a mother tree, as some people call it, or a hub tree, because it retains mycorrhizal networks and you know, literally the soil system around it. Um, it's like more of a mother that's gone through menopause and is now a grandmother, you know? It's like, she's not really, ab she's able to help trees through nutrient exchange that are near her, but not produce any new ones of her own. So I don't know if that helps you understand it more, but the importance of these big trees is um, different. Like people, cut down a lot of trees for firewood that are in the perfect age for reproducing, you know, if you think about how old it is. So, whereas a tree like this, this is what people used to cut down, you know, 100 years ago, with the exception of the Isaac Worrell Beach over there, which was probably too, cut, too big to cut down axes or something back then. A lot of big beaches and oaks get left like that, and they're called wolf trees sometimes. Um, so, yeah, just to play devil's advocate, this is probably a tree that's not going to live as long and not have as much of an effect on the trees around it, even though we love it more and everybody's going to come over to you and hug it when they see it and ask me if it's 200 years old, you know, so. Um, Mike, was, was the uh, decline in acorn production sudden, like one season it had it and never again? Or no, no, I mean, they make acorns from their like late 30s into their early 100, you know, and even some of the big oaks will make acorns after like 300 years or so, but it's just sparse. Um, trees grow more as yep. they get older too. Yeah, so it just doesn't appear that way because it's putting on all its growth and bark for the most part. So it's probably still growing more and more every year. Um, and the one thing I want, for those of you who've been to Newland Grist Mill, you probably, I imagine you all know where it is. <laughs> I live near, uh, mill at Anselma in Chester County and these are two of the oldest mills in the entire like North America like mill Anselma actually is the oldest and longest run um, and they have a piece of white oak that's 250 years old so white oak was specifically used for applications where water would be involved you know I, don't, I think there was a water wheel here right 
I don't know. Oh, you know what? There, so there used to be, so back um, in like 1848, they put in a mill race. So they put in an artificial okay. stream and down at that end of the park, which I don't know if we'll, we probably won't get that far. There was a shingle mill that's been documented. The one takeaway I want you to have about the white oak is people talk about indicator species a lot. Every single plant, every single organism is an indicator species to people who know ecology. So where I live in northern Chester County, we have the Bryn Coed Oak. If anyone's been to Bryn Coed Farms, it's the biggest white oak in Pennsylvania. And we have like two, three, four, and five, all within uh, like a 10 minute drive from my house. Mm -hmm. And there's and the ones that aren't registered, are there's still a whole bunch of 200 year old white oaks. Mm -hmm. And even when you drive by in the winter, everywhere you see the white oaks, it's like you're literally looking back and you're just making a map of the the areas that have changed the least out of everything. And that's still the case here too. The white oaks, you know, it's different if you go to West Virginia or something where every tree is a white oak. But around here, these are the most special trees we could find other than maybe the hemlock, you know? Right. Um, and the chestnut and the butternut, remnants of which we have around here. So the indicator for white oaks, the absolute indicator is deep soils. That's what white oaks indicate. So you may see them growing on cliff top, but anything growing on cliff top is gonna to grow to a stunted height, you know? So anywhere you see white oaks, there are deep soils. And that's why they become more common just as you get a little further into the Piedmont um, in Chester, in Lancaster County. And they, that's why they're the biggest over there because we have really deep soils. But that's why these also are near wetlands. And then, you know, I usually talk about how I, I kind of try to go back in time and show people like all of these spice bushes, you have to imagine three quarters of them not being here and then most of them down by the creek in the lower half and that's what it would have looked like. And then the rest of this up, upper half of the hills would be maple leaf viburnum, arrowwood viburnum, pagoda dogwood. Um, and one of the things I want to do is stop by the only remnant arrowwood viburnum patch on the other side, which I always stop at, but <laughs> yeah, it's a good one. Um, and similarly, like the red oaks would be on the top half. And nowadays everything's kind of mixed. So I try to teach people habitat types because if you can get them in your head, you can see them everywhere you go for the rest of your life because there's only like three big ones right here, you know? Um, but we'll keep going because I just wanted to leave this one with you before we talk about the black oaks down further. Yeah. So um, yeah, onward, we're gonna look at black oaks because it's kind of another it's, oh, it deserves ahead. more love than other oaks I mean, I mean, Chestnuts. There's an account from the early 1930s saying, because the blight came through starting in like 1916, wiped out most of the American chestnuts. They keep regrowing from their roots, but then they quickly die. They get overcome with the blight. Um, but there was an account from the early 30s that there were a number of chestnut saplings in this park right before it got made into a park. And we found two surviving American chestnuts on this hillside further down that so far have shown no signs of blight and we had them confirmed by the American Chestnut Foundation as being pure American and one of them is like 30 feet tall. The diameters, you know, yeah, pretty like big. big around. Yeah, not bad. Yeah. Not, I mean, they're, so who knows? I mean, they may still succumb to blight, but it was just fun to yeah. have found two surviving American chestnuts in the park. Yeah, and it's a really good indicator. So like from Woods to Swarthmore College, I've found like five there and mm -hmm. one of them's the biggest one in Eastern Pennsylvania. How big is it? Uh, by now it's probably over 50 feet tall and it's get, it didn't show blight until like five, six years ago. So, um, but oh, by me in French Creek State Park, which was cut down for World War II, there's chestnut sprouts everywhere. Yeah, they're all over the place. And presumably um, other trees are helping to keep them alive. That's kind of the only answer people have. But also, even though we have the American Chestnut Foundation here, um, at Tyler Arboretum, they're focused mostly on breeding. There, I have a whole list of like 20 things that people have not tried. We haven't really focused at all on trying to keep our living health nuts, health, our living chestnuts healthy. Mm -hmm. um, we just try to breed and we've ignored like 90% of what we should be doing to mm -hmm. save the American chestnut. Mm -hmm. So um, you could even with pruning, just keep it in a non big tree existence as it is now and keep it healthier too. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if people have tried, people will try a hundred different things for their, their house plants and their garden plants, but they won't go to their chestnut tree with neem oil or fertilizer or uh, mm -hmm. good thoughts and intentions. So people have completely missed the boat on that. And I'm hoping it's not too late.
but you need um, a lot more neem oil for a tree than you do for a house plant. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> trees. Every single, every single tree here, every, with the exception of the Norway spruce and the hemlock and the white pine, every tree in this entire park can be coppice, can be cut back and regrown, and have its lifespan lengthened and produce firewood at like 60 times the rate that it normally would when if you intervene correctly. So anyway, we're talking too much over here. Let's get going. The black oak is dead. There's only a few of it left. No more seedlings are coming. Mm -hmm. And nobody cares about the black oak anymore. I've seen exactly zero planted in my 15 years as a professional gardener, with the exception of like restoration efforts. And even so, most of the don't really grow them, you know? Those are the only people planting these things are the people who are do planting thousands of trees a day on large ecological restoration projects. So give the black oak some love. It's actually our biggest, tallest oak. They definitely get to like 120 feet. They get to unreasonable heights. Um, and this is where everything I'm gonna say kind of falls apart because there's white oaks around us and this, <laughs> this is an indicator of like thin soils, you know? So the chestnut oak, less so is an indicator of the soils that it's in, um, even though we see them growing higher up. Uh, where the black oaks are, but the black oaks and the chestnut oaks don't share the same habitat per se. Just around here, you pretty much only see these in the really in really nice neighborhoods around here, like Middletown, Gradyville, and people's backyards at the tops of hills where they didn't cut down trees. That's where you see the black oaks and the little uh, chanterelle mushrooms and everything that come up in the summer in the mossy areas where people don't mow. Yeah. So, I, yeah. So chestnut oak. Well, the black oak has the biggest leaves too. I didn't pick one up, but that's kind of the easiest ideas, ideas that could be this big. The chestnut oak is named for its similarity to the chestnut in like many, many ways. Habitat, bark, um, maybe just the size of its nuts and the leaves, which look most like them. So I guess we'll go all the way around. Um, last time I was here, I used the term heath bald. <laughs> and if you look down here, you can see all these mountain laurels over there and behind us. And those were previously sunny openings. So we passed a sunny opening early on where um, the barberry and the Japanese knotweed and the burning bush and spice bush and box elder are coming up over there. Like those new gap gaps that open quickly get invaded by invasive species. But that's an old gap that was sunny for a long time on a steep spot where these evergreens could grow and they're also not going to be here forever. But the hollies are probably doing better in the shade than the mountain laurels. So that's a former heath bald, if you really want to... How do you heath bald? Heath bald, B-A-L-D. Oh, like, 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 like a bald like, spot in the yeah. forest. Yeah, kind of. So that's what you see when you drive up towards the Poconos on the sides of the roads and everything where there aren't as much tree cover. Um, on Mount Alverno Road locally, there's a good heath bald with uh, Pinkster azalea coming up. So we'll head, we'll do a big, do a big leap towards the bottom. Well, we're gonna talk about this dichotomy of here and over there and how they're entirely different management. Yeah. And the reason I wanna talk about it is because the county really trusts the two of you. <laughs> and you guys have actually been able to get a lot done here. And I, I regularly use Friends of Glen Providence Park as uh, like to point out how good a job you've done here. But also there's immense tasks going forward in this park. And this is, so we're gonna stop here just to, I wanna show everyone the dichotomy of this hillside versus that hillside. And how, for those of you who can identify invasive plants, if you look this way, everything under 10 feet is an invasive plant, pretty much. Yeah. Honeysuckle, privet, barberry, burning bush. Everything this way under 10 feet is a uh, mountain laurel that the deer won't eat and nothing else. So this is a much more difficult situation for volunteers and um, people who don't have an immense amount of funding to deal with. It, you know, most of our time volunteering has been spent removing invasive shrubs and replacing them with small trees and shrubs. Um, so this is more of a challenge. And actually, Marcia mentioned we get, a lot of, we get a lot of traffic through here, which doesn't help. They're really steep slopes. The mountain laurels are disappearing as it's kind of covering up. So if you saw a situation like this 
in a more like southern climate, like in Texas or something, you know, you probably want to cut down trees and get more water hitting the ground and infiltrating further. But here we don't really do that, but there's a lot of like industrious beaver style tricks you can use to redirect water and such down here. Um, and it's a pretty long process. But again, also planting in here is different, difficult. And this is the ideal situation where regeneration of the existing trees is your best effort, but they might all just roll down the hill. So that's why putting a lot of work into making brush bars and stuff can be helpful. Making brush bars, you know, like a little control, a little erosion control beaver style bundles. Oh. You know, you can put stakes in the ground like this right. and then... Almost like hugel culture. Kind of, yeah, but you pretty much just make a wall and then leaves will collect naturally and right. eventually tree seedlings will germinate. So, but this all comes down to like water and nutrients, like the higher invasive plants growing like crazy over there. It's because it's the bottom of the hill mm -hmm. and there's more nutrients than has ever been in these waters and in these soils, an immense amount. And a lot of our weeds proliferate in areas of like low calcium, otherwise disturb, disturbed mm -hmm. mic microbiota, or just like tons of nitrogen and phosphorus and even aluminum and other things that they're not used to having. So anytime so, you see- so that's yeah. coming from homeowners. Yeah, so like anytime you see burdock growing, like this big, about to, you know, eat your child, it's, uh, it's because there's aluminum and other toxic, if we say, nutrients in the soil that other plants aren't dealing with. So it's doing its job, but why is that plant there? It's not just because seeds are all over the place. Like something has to make weed seeds germinate, you know? Something has to make these privet uh, live and spread, which is birds eating the berries in the fall because they hold them for into the winter, basically, into now. So, um, it's super complicated, the more you learn. So I don't think I taught anybody anything. But, <laughs> <laughs> but this is just a great spot, because it's like a tale of two parts, you know, it really yeah. is. And this is the more daunting one, but this is your better preserved ecosystem, too, right? Right. You know, you, have, you already have witch hazel, spice bush, a few random viburnums. So if you were to cover this with viburnums and pagoda dogwood, and even the service berry that's up yep. there, yep. Um, things like that, but yeah, we will keep going and I'm going to talk about, I guess we can go all the way to, to the uh, bridge. <laughs> yeah, and the one, the one thing I did want to say is all of these logs that you see, all of these are oak. Oh, yeah. They last a really long time. Young bush that's like yellow or green sometimes. So this is a high bush blueberry. Um, Have you ever seen any low bush is, here? I don't know, but they're they're uh, around. Yeah. There's there's a whole bunch. If you go to Houston Meadows in Wissahickon Park, uh -huh. it's a, a popular birding destination. They have a whole bunch of different vaccinium, including deerberry, yeah. vaccinium stamium, oh, like sure. huge, full wow. sun. But um, otherwise, it's like not too many. You know, you go to the wetlands, you see this every now and then. Yeah. Oh, this, I was, and I wanted to look at this. I think this is one also. But, yeah, so this is a blue bay. Uh, so yeah, two blueberries, but you can even say these are literally, a, this is a remnant patch of your high bush blueberry population here. So the blueberries, you can take cuttings of the new growth and grow them pretty quickly. But um, you can also buy them like wholesale for like six or seven bucks, plant them everywhere. So elderberry, elderberry hazelnut, hazelnut and blueberry. I mean, they're definitely our best edible shrubs that we have. Um, and is it a special kind of blueberry that you have to buy, not from you? Yeah, you're asking a big question. <laughs> and that, so like, I, I buy them for Oct Octorero. They grow them from cuttings in South Jersey. Um, and they'll, you know, they'll be like a one, less than a one gallon pot. They'll be really small. Or you can buy cultivated varieties of which you'll get into realizing that there's early season, mid season, mid late, 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 very late. And then there's all the things they were bred for, you know disease resistance, harvestability by machines, maybe, um, storage. So if you go way back and get the old varieties from New Jersey, they're the most uh, nutritious, like Elizabeth and Darrow. Um, Ruble, 
R-U-B-E-L is the most nutritious one. And then there's pink ones. So I have one called Pink Lemonade mm -hmm. and my neighbor's daughters really like them. So if you want to plant them and never eat them, plant, you know, <laughs> get a pink one, all the kids will take them. One of the most high, the highest nutritional blueberry is actually the low bush blueberry. Yeah, people say that. And people in the, in the north, in Maine and Michigan, yeah. eat a lot more of those. Yeah. But people in the Carolinas also will tell you the rabbit eyes taste better. And you can but grow a rabbit eye. Taste is too. not the question. They, yeah. they do taste pretty good, but the, the low bush blueberry, they're, they're smaller. I've heard yeah. and read that you can actually burn them to the ground and they come back up, those shrubs. Yeah. And in the Pine Barrens, uh, after there's a fire, you often get morels and blueberries. Yep. Blueberries take a few years, yeah. but um, they'll get really, really big. It'll be like a thicket you can't walk through. Right, right. Yeah. So, but now that we found two blueberry shrubs, there's more obligation for you to plant more here. Yeah, Hazel, and Hazel we did last year, we did. We do that yeah. almost every planting. Yeah, so ha hazelnut's a shrub. I bill it as virtually your only deer resistant like edible plant other than the pawpaw. You know, pawpaw and hazelnut are your native fruits that deer won't touch for the most part. They will like literally browse a hazelnut, like bite one every now and then. But I have 25 on my property and only one of them has been nibbled. Like they would have all been gone by now. Well, that's yeah. the other thing is coincidentally, hazelnut and pawpaw are your two most shade tolerant foods. Okay. You know, blueberries more, they need the right soil. Right. Okay. Um, but. The hazelnut, and elder, elderberry yeah. Elderberry will be sort of okay in semi-shade, right? Yeah, they don't always fruit as much, right. but um, the elderberries, probably your best bang through buck edible plant, period, because you can get two of them, or you can even get one, and it can be 10 feet by 10 feet. So as far as plants that you can plant for restoration purposes, the fastest growing are staghorn sumac, far and away, is not even a second place. It's your absolute best cover of ground. And then elderberry and hazelnut are really, really high on the list. And I don't know why, like they're literally our best shrubs for restoration and nobody plants them in their gardens. So what's going on people? Like these are our, our most expensive edibles too. Hazelnuts are expensive. Elderberry products are expensive, right. you know? And it just so happens that when I was working the Philly Park System, they grow bigger and faster than all of the native shrubs we plant, even the viburnums. There's no question about it. Willows is the other exception, you know, because they far and away grow the fastest. So hazelnut, I tell people all the time because there's remnant populations too. There's like two in the crumb woods and there's one on, uh, I don't remember the names of the roads anymore. Ridley Park Road, up by that, uh, you go up this way. Uh, Ridley Creek State. Yeah, yeah. It's when you come to an intersection and there's a little shop, hilltop that shell, sells like Oh. Landscape supplies. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Right yeah. there at that corner, you yeah. can see a hazelnut next to a pawpaw patch. Oh, really? There's like one car spot on the side of the road. And if you think about the hazelnuts and pawpaws, they pretty much extend through this valley up through Swarthmore, yeah. just in sparse populations. So, like, you have pawpaws right down the street in, um, I call it Mineral Hill. I guess it's. Yeah. There's no pawpaws there. They don't give any pawpaw, any fruit. Right. So we're going to get to that. <laughs> yeah. So there's seven <laughs> patches in the Crumb Woods, which is like six more patches than anywhere else around here. But everywhere from Bucks County, even into New Jersey a bit, all the way down to Rock Creek Park in DC, none of the pawpaws are fruiting. They're all remnant patches. But if you go out west and southwest to, uh, like all those canals between Southern Pennsylvania and West, Southern Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Maryland area, where all that Revolutionary War history, is like pawpaws on the side of the road and they fruit because they're reproducing over there. So planting pawpaws in this park would be a great idea because they're going to fruit more than the ones in the wild anyway. We actually know? got fruit this year. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, we so planted there you go. a number yeah. of them and we got fruit this year and it was delicious. Yeah, and they're on the bottom half anywhere the creek is. You can put them all over this park. Mm -hmm. So I know people do a really good job of finding native plants and trying to get a diversity, but at the same time, like the toothpaste, <laughs> the to yeah, <laughs> yeah, the toothpaste is out of the tube. Like, let's go big. Let's plant blueberries and hazelnuts and elderberries everywhere, you know, and the deer don't seem to, they eat elderberry a little bit, but only because they push their leaves out earlier in the spring and they attract them and then they eat them and then they're kind of poisonous and they never come back. So. Um, so, and they're good yeah. for pollinators. Oh yeah, yeah, I guess so. Don't they have a giant umbel? Yeah, flower. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when they're really big and full sun, 
they just attract the little unglamorous pollinators. Mm -hmm. That's all. But yeah. they're important too. Yeah. So yeah, we'll keep going. Sorry. Quick. These are so we're gonna talk about cherries real quick. Um, so these, all these cherries. This one with the different colored bark. Yeah. This one. This one. That one. And then there's the one with the ivy and the one to the right of it. Those are all uh, like bird cherry, Prunus avium, where our sour cherries are bred from, or it's like, or they're hybrids that just landed in the woods. Oh. So in the cherry world, this is my show and tell. It's winter, <laughs> so I've been taking wild cherry bark syrup. Does anybody use wild cherry bark? No. So this is what I wanted to show you. This and elderberry are your best medicines. So it's in honey and vinegar and all that other good stuff. Mm -hmm. So. Um, wild cherry bark comes from black cherry, Prunus serotina, our native weedy, wonderful wildlife tree. Mm -hmm. um, Prunus virginiana, the choke cherry, which is the favorite fruit of bears, period. Um, and they're kind of at the edge of the range here. If you go to Pottstown in southern Berks County, they begin like on the shale. When the, the rocks change to shale, you get choke cherries. Mm -hmm. And um, they're both, so the cherries are great for the reason that they're annoying is why they're so great. So the black cherries came from the mountains in Pennsylvania and as Pennsylvania turned into farmland, birds dropped them all over the new farms. Mm -hmm. And when they're in our forests, actually, yes, there's one straight ahead. And I was gonna talk about how they're usually squiggly and awful looking. And this one straight ahead, that black cherry is perfectly straight. Oh. And mm -hmm. then this one leaning to the left, it's got two or three trunks. Mm -hmm. So the someone's walking by with it. So the black cherry and the black walnut are two most valuable Thank timber you. trees, mostly for like veneer for cabinets or mm -hmm. gun stocks or things like that, you know. Um, but the black cherries really grow much bigger in the mountains and they they grow a little bit crazier here. Mm -hmm. So suddenly it's not our best timber tree, but people love them as wildlife trees, right? But if you look at the top of that one, you can see all the black stuff that's like uh, on the twigs, that's black knot of cherry. So that's something that can affect our like cultivated um, prunus species. Um, it's not a big deal, but a wildlife tree with its berries and you know cherries and plums, the prunus genus, uh, uh, play host to a lot of Lepidoptera larvae, moth mm -hmm. and butterfly caterpillars, um, amongst the most with oaks, beeches, willows, um, so what's weird is the flowers of our native black cherry are different than all the other ones. They come in a panicle and they come after all of our cherry blossoms mm -hmm. have bloomed. They come later. That's what serotina, prunus serotina means late flowering or late fruiting. Um, but if they get their cherries like first, all of a sudden it's the middle of summer and you're like, this was blooming a month ago and then yeah. there's black cherries hanging down. Um, choke cherry gets them later, but they're also black. So they provide edible food for us that you can make in jam. They're great for wildlife, for the purpose of growing butterfly larvae and for making berries for birds. Also, other than the black gum, they're like remarkably big for berry trees, mm -hmm. you know? Most of our other big trees make nuts or akines. But it's great as value, it's timber we can't really use here. So they're great firewood. But, the old, but this is the one thing that people have like almost forgotten. And that's that wild cherry bark is the absolute best known Native American medicine. Mm -hmm. And black cherry to me is like a prune on site tree. They grow everywhere a bird has pooped on a fence, a black cherry is growing out of it that needs to be pruned mm -hmm. badly. And so in the fall and early spring is great time to harvest the bark off of the branches mm -hmm. or to cut down the stupid squiggly black cherry that's growing in your fence line and use it for firewood. So to me, the black cherry is the ultimate wildlife tree but it's overabundant and uncared for and needs to be pruned more. And mm -hmm. while doing so, will make wonderful mm -hmm. firewood and medicine that tastes good when you put it in honey. Mm -hmm. And is useful primarily for like bad coughs, like hacking coughs, it's mm -hmm. an antispasmodic. Mm -hmm. So it's like a little bit past that tickle in your throat <laughs> feeling you might get. It's like when you're actually sick. Um, and similarly, elderberry is probably one of the other great Native American remedies um, use, which I use literally in the same exact fashion. I, well, you know, you could put it in tastier things, you know, 
mm -hmm. tea or kombucha, mm -hmm. vodka. And the elderberry is for like flu symptoms or something? It's for, it's for boosting your, yeah, yeah, boosting like your immune system generally. Oh, okay. <laughs> but uh, wild cherry bark and elderberry fruit in syrup <laughs> form are excellent for kids. Yeah. And that'll eliminate like half of the medicine that you would buy for children otherwise, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of vitamin C too. Yeah. B, and B12, yeah. So yeah, all the berries are super vitamin rich and everything. But the cherry bark is cool and I had cherry wild cherry burning in my wood stove this year and I, you know, because it dries out the house, I put the wild cherry bark in a pot on top of the wood stove and made it at the same time. It made the house smell good. So it was like great victory. And <laughs> I didn't and it didn't involve the typical use of the black cherry or what we think of. So the two native species are good for medicine. All the wild ones from Europe or otherwise are not really used as medicine. Mm -hmm. Probably could be. I don't really know. Um, but they're here and I'm cool with them and I generally don't cut them down. One of the weird things about names of plants is that like there's a lot of trickery involved that you don't know about. And white ash is the one I use as an example. Like white refers to the underside of the leaf. Ash refers to the color of the bark. Mm -hmm. Like, But how would you know that <laughs> if you just read white ash? So white oak refers to the inner bark. Red oak refers to the inner bark. Black oak refers kind of to the bark generally, not so much the inner bark. So all of these common names, sometimes they can be misleading, but the arrowwoods, arrowwoods seem fine. So this is Southern arrowwood viburnum dentatum, which has multiple varieties and is confusing. All the viburnums can be confusing when you get into the botany of it. So this is one of our four most common around here. The other ones being black haw, maple leaf viburnum, and the one I'm forgetting. So. <laughs> Possum haw? Maybe. Possum haw is rare in our area. Yeah. It's really rare in the wetlands. And we don't really have nannyberry either. Right. Um, but yeah, we'll say one of the big three. So yeah. southern arrowwood, black haw, and uh, maple leaf viburnum are the most common. Right. Cranberry and viburnum, another one. That's the, the other one, and they're yeah. a little more north of here. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, but this, when you see arrowwood, this is actually it. This is these new shoots. This is what would be used for an arrow. So I want to stop because this is really, it'll really make you believe, right? Yeah. So if you want to make arrows, you've got to put it in full sun. And whenever you see them in the woods, they do exactly this. Mm -hmm. So you can identify viburnum dentatum mm -hmm. anytime in the woods because when they're that low in the woods, mm -hmm. stuff will get stuck on them and they get really dark. Mm -hmm. So if you see like a black shrub like sitting down like this, it's probably the viburnum. And it's partly why they do so great on hills too, because mm -hmm. they always just okay. bend. But if you pruned it regularly, which I encourage people to prune plants in the wild too, even here, like all these shrubs and cages can be pruned. There's no reason you shouldn't. Um, but if you prune them, you get more cool stuff like this. Mm -hmm. You get more uses out of it. So along here, um, you planted a, a whole bunch of river birches. So the birch family is another family that I try to give some love to because they get neglected in horticulture and are surprisingly deer resistant and important like all the other things I talk about. So if you look back here, right through there are the smooth alders. Mm -hmm. So we can like very quickly learn the whole birch family. So we're gonna do it right now, assuming I remember them all. The white or grayish uh, gray birch that people know of the Pinelands and the Poconos, which is pretty much gone from our area. You may you literally see one or two left in like 10 miles. Um, if you go out 25 miles west, you start to see them more. But as soon as you get to the Pine Barrens or the Poconos, they show up. And then we have the sweet birch and the river birch. And so all of these, the ones that we plant in- And Hort yellow birch, did we say yellow birch? And yellow birch, yeah. So yellow birch actually occurs about 25 miles west. My street's pretty much where they begin. And the river birches of our area also aren't super common, but if you go to Maryland, they are. If you go to North Jersey, they are. It just depends where you are. Um, and then the sweet birch is one of our longest lived, oldest birch trees. The yellow birch gets bigger. If you go to the Poconos, all the hemlock trees that got cut down were regrown up in yellow birch. They have beautiful mottled bark. They look like they're glowing. And people cut them down for firewood. So that's the whole birch family. So to answer the question of what to do when trees fall, use the birch family. 
So we have examples like that sassafras colony over there that have lived in a, a gap phase, a gap, um, an opening in the canopy for a hundred years now. But what we're missing and what you can see, if, has anybody been to Wissahickon Valley Park? Mm -hmm. So if you go along Forbidden Drive, um, you'll see the good things of this park replicated in tenfold there. You'll see more hemlocks and you'll see uh, more chestnuts and oak, big, really big oaks. And you'll see a lot of birches. You'll see sweet birch all over the place. And they are like to the point of being weedy in their openings. And that's exactly what we need to reintroduce around here because they have a lot of medicine. They make medicinal mushrooms. Um, if you know the birch polypore and the cinnabar red polypore is another good like uh, ID. And the deer don't really eat them because they all smell a little bit like mint. They smell like methyl salicylate and they grow really fast and nobody grows them, <laughs> nobody plants them. So that's my long winded answer to your question is like find your remnant populations of birches and just plant birches wherever the opening is. So yeah, beech is great. They are kind of becoming a little overrepresented in our oak forests because they do so well in shade and they tolerate deer a little bit better. And I would just tell people to think of them as an oak. The oaks and the beech are members of the beech family, you know, and they all have disease issues that are coming up and they all are very long lived. It does seem like there's much more of them on that side of the, yeah. and the one thing I'll say is if you're thinking about ha habitat types, the beech is associated with maple and um, tulip tree. But if you go a little bit further north, it's maple and birch. Mm -hmm. um, and that is considered, uh, this is someone coming by. It's considered to be an ecosystem that doesn't climax, like mm -hmm. in the same way that a mixed oak chestnut forest wood that doesn't quite have as long lived species or as much diversity mm -hmm. and they're usually on the lower halves of slopes or in shady areas so the natural progression of most of the mid-atlantic is for oak forests to be transitioning into tulip tree beach <laughs> maple forests which rightfully so should be uh considered to be less of slightly less value which is yeah, sorry. Sorry, but yeah, I'm <laughs> so. <laughs> so this is prob what I assume to be a sugar maple. Um, no. Right? Well, that's why I stopped. I don't know if it's true. But sugar maples do a couple things. They get attacked by sap suckers. Yeah. They have these weird bust out points. Sometimes they're thinner down here than they are like up here. Mm. They uh, like have a full belly kind of, <laughs> and they have this black, they get this black coloration on them. So the sugar maple, I don't normally talk about climate change, but there's a few trees that we know mm. over the past century really have been negatively affected. The birches, particularly the gray birch in like 1920s and 30s. I mean, we have invasive insects that were introduced a hundred years ago that decimated populations that we've forgotten about. We've forgotten about the bronze birch borer. Um, and then uh, we know about the elm and the butternut and the American chestnut. And the hemlock would be the other big example. So hemlock and sugar maple are your two big examples of trees in Pennsylvania that have been negatively affected by changes in winter weather and subsequent fungal and insect infections for the past 70 years or so. Um, a lot of this is known from Penn State, like in the 50s and 60s, people noticed after World War II that like, tr trees were just dying and it was uh, attributed to everything imaginable, you know, like, <laughs> like actually a lot of hemlocks in Pennsylvania died because of road salt, you know, because we put our highways through these forests and then people would see all these hemlocks dying. So the sugar maple is one that basically has fine roots that die back more often when there's more freeze thaw. So the, the biggest change in our climate in Pennsylvania, in southeastern Pennsylvania in particular, in the past century and a half, or even in the past 30 years, however you want to phrase it, is in lack of snow cover that we have now. So not only is there less snow cover that actually insulates the ground for these trees and that they're used to, um, we have these constant temperatures like we do today where 
it might get down below freezing and then it might get back up during the day and then it might do that for like two thirds of your winter, you know? Like I love when it's in the 30s at night, the 40s during the day, or even the 30s during the day because I can work outside comfortably. But these trees don't like it. They want the temperatures to be more, I don't know what the word would be, uh, consistent in the winter. Mm -hmm. So that's the main reason why they're dying back. And we see few of them. There's an unbelievable amount in uh, the Martin Forest, which is the north end of Smedley, the very end of Smedley Park by the baseball field. Mm -hmm. If you drive all the way back there, you'll see pretty much more sugar maples there than the entire county combined. Mm -hmm. And the easiest way to tell is in November, when you look at all the Norway maples, mm -hmm. a little bit before the Norway maples turn yellow, you'll see the sugar maples turn yellow and you'll realize that there's not that many around here. Mm -hmm. And the ones we have are planted and they're all orange and red and beautiful. Mm -hmm. But um, this is one that we have more as soon as you get north or in higher elevation. And it doesn't really achieve its value down here. We can't really tap them as much. Kind of, if you go a little north towards like the AT and Kutztown area, you get sugar maples there, mm -hmm. big ones. Um, but also, weirdly enough, if you go to south, southwest Virginia, you might hit a sugar bush a sugar stand, like a huge stand of sugar maples all of a sudden, even though it's this northern tree. But West Virginia is so mountainous that mm -hmm. a lot of the plants yeah. reappear there that we think we would lose in the coastal plain or south generally. So, um, same as all the other trees I point out, there's probably not that many seedlings of it. And you gotta learn how to tell it from the Norway maple bud. I think the sugar maple buds look like ice cream cones. I don't know if that's helpful, but if you have them next to each other, you'll see it. <laughs> so this is a good one. Um, again, really long lived, probably our longest lived maple, our least common in this area. One that we're losing and the one that people know the most. This is the one that people know. They think like non-plants people, when they think of a maple, they think of New York and they think of Canada and they think of this maple leaf and they think of maple sugar. So mm -hmm. that's, it has almost more importance in culture around here than it does like ecological value. Mm -hmm. So not not to say anything bad about all these trees. But. So that's why I wanted to stop for this guy. Because it, it bears all of the weird physical markings of an old sugar maple that's uh, healthy but doing its thing, you know, getting attacked by woodpeckers and stuff. <laughs> As they are Yeah, and the pat the history of this hill right here is like I think kind of unknown. Like we don't really know what this looks like. This is the farthest from its original ecotype. And the pictures, usage. yeah, yeah, the pictures of this from again, like the description in 18, 1889 says nearly devoid of trees, and the pictures from the early 1930s, no trees here. Weird, yeah. So these are planted since like 1935, yeah. which is crazy. I wonder. I don't know if this was like park-like, but along like up here. Yeah, I'm not, I, have, I want to go back. I could scrutinize those because there's actually an aerial photograph from like 1936. So okay. I could scrutinize that and like overlay the park boundaries. Yeah. It was, there were like a few trees, but again, most of this was just clear. One thing I wanted to point out was we have these young evergreens here. And I don't know that these were planted, these pine trees here. I don't know. Um, this may be, you know, mostly pine but some spruce seeding in up here for some reason so if it is i don't know we can learn from that you yeah. know so american holly is endangered in pennsylvania well it's threatened threatened, really? threatened in pennsylvania and it's uncommon in our area and it would be up in the mountains right um kind of like on the at even so but even here and in the crumb woods and in the wissahickon park and all these areas where people have been gardening for a long time this holly is all over the place and i think they're great because the deer don't eat them they're evergreen, and they're kind of taking place of a holly that might have been there. And in this case, this one's acting a bit as a nurse uh, tree or a shelter. So we have one of our, another remnant viburnum right here, mm -hmm. and the tangle of spice bush and cat greenbrier. So the cat greenbrier. Um, I've never heard that term, cat greenbrier. I, Smilax rotundifolia, yeah. they're all cat briar, but I just use it to delineate this one in particular. Okay. Because uh, there's a three or four species around here. Okay. But um, this is how you get native plant to survive. You hide it behind all these other spicy trees, and then a deer won't get in here to eat this guy. Mm -hmm. So um, those are annoying, but yeah, they're great. And also when you get into New Jersey and Delaware, you'll see these all over the coastal plain. Yeah.
Like, it's like they're multi four of those. <laughs> but but yeah. native. Yeah, but native. This is another cherry grown all crazy. Oh, so is this a cherry? Yeah, and so presumably so bir birds are dropping these black cherry fruit uh -huh. while they're sitting up in these evergreen trees, mm -hmm. you know? And then they're going all crazy. Yeah, that is a crazy one for sure. Yeah. And um, weather like we have this past week mm -hmm. makes me sad. Yeah, because oh, open really? they're, they're literally they're opening on days like this. Yeah. So that's called a frost crack, and yeah. they become a frost yeah. rib sometimes if you see it emerging. Oh. Yeah, yeah. And they're it's almost counterintuitive, but more likely on the south side of a tree in yeah. the winter where it warms up more. Yeah, a previous really infection. Yeah. yeah, so Pretty literally, yeah, so this lovely weather we're having makes cracks yeah. on trees. Yeah. Too. Yeah. <laughs> so, Mike, are you saying these are Norway fruits? Is that what you think they are? Yeah, and so they look like firs. Right. That's the issue with the Norway spruce, Picea abies. Picea is the genus for spruce, abies is the genus for fir. Right. Firs are flat and friendly, spruces hurt. Oh. This is a spruce that doesn't hurt and is kind of flat. Yeah. So even though it's the spruce we know, it's the one that doesn't look as much like a spruce. Yeah, it's yeah. so, right. Um, call it. But yeah, and the Norway spruce realistically is one of the most important trees in the world. It's probably the most important, like temperate. Why do you say that? Timber tree. For trim, yeah. timber, they Just like Douglas fir would be one of the most important trees in the world. So these two trees, this one and the one right behind you, are bitter nut hickories. We have four species of hickory in our area. They're related to the black walnut and the butternut. Of those four hickories, three of them have an edible nut two of which are excellent, the shagbark and the pig nut. The shagbark's really, oh, and the mocker nut. I guess they can all be eaten, but mocker is kind of because they're small. The bitter nut, that's what we have here. So these are the deer resistant ones that grow the fastest and produce the wood of the lowest quality and the fruit of the lowest quality. So needless to say, these are our most common ones nowadays around here. And oddly enough, three of the four species i mentioned the state champion the biggest in pennsylvania is in ridley creek state park oh. and even if you go um, on mineral hill there's a couple bitter nut hickories that are massive oh. absolutely massive mm -hmm. and the easiest way to tell with this is all the hickories have this intersecting bark and this is like this and the pig nut are the least furrowed the mocker nut and the shag bark have more extreme bark so, so what do you mean by intersecting? <laughs> these furrows, you can tell they don't just go straight. They yes. literally zigzag back and yeah, forth. Okay. Intersecting is a specific word I use for bark. Yeah, so you can see that here. Yeah. And these, when they're, if you look at this one up higher, it looks smoother. So when they're young, it looks like a tulip tree almost. Uh -huh. um, so the bit bitter nuts have these yellow bugs. <laughs> Actually, now that I'm looking, I have questions about this hickory. They can be hard to tell sometimes because these buds look a little bigger. This looks a lot like a pig nut, but um, they're all good to know. There's less of them than there used to be. It'd be great to have the shag bark hickory in here. It seems like the pig nut used to be the most common in our area. 25 miles west, it's shag bark and mocker nut. And the bitter nuts, they're basically here because the deer don't eat them, mm -hmm. but they're easy to identify. So in the winter, yeah. a lot of the trees that do well, like the tulip tree yeah. and the white ash and the bitternut hickory, you'll see the little yellow buds. Last time I led a walk, we talked about the cork trees that are here. Cork? No, a lot more about cork trees now after studying herbalism a bit. Um, but this area, I wanted to point out a few trees. So this is the cork tree which we'll call Philodendron amarensi. Is it the amar cork? Is that what they say? Amar yeah. Amar and there's three species that are all allegedly here and they all have different names and they're all this one as far as I'm concerned. And uh, <laughs> as far as Tim Block is concerned also, who wrote the book on it. But you'll see di three different names for these and I don't know if they're all around, but this is the one that gets around. So the the thing about this I used to point out with Japanese barber that it's yellow on the inside. Yeah. It contains berberine. So does anyone know what berberine does? 
turns you yellow. <laughs> turns you yellow, yeah, it totally does. Yeah, so a lot of plants that have yellow or gold in the name. Chinese coptis is called gold thread. Japanese barberry, Amber cork tree. I'm trying to think, uh, native species would be golden seal, has berberine in its roots. Mm. Bloodroot has sanguarine, which is similar to berberine. It's kind of more orangey. Um, yellow root, Xanthoriza simplicissima, a slightly Simplicis southern. Simplicissima? Simplicissima, yeah. Xanthoriza, xanthos, yellow, yellow root. root. That right. one we call yellow root. So all of these yellowy trees um, have berberine, which in the Western world, we, we primarily think of it as being antibacterial. Um, and it's... All the herbs are used differently, but they're big in Chinese medicine. Chinese coptis has a really high amount of berberine. But golden seal is our number two best known medicinal herb in North America behind ginseng. And uh, is generally speaking considered the most useful to this day, more so than ginseng because of its concerns. And the fact that 95% of it gets shipped to China. So um, golden seal is like the the icon of the native medicinal plant movement, which is pretty small, I own part of it. <laughs> um, so I have my pruners, shouldn't do this, but if you get a branch, but you can see the yellow under there. Mm -hmm. And that's not native, correct? No, no. no. This and is I, an invasive species. I don't even know how species. they even got here. From Philly, <laughs> from Were the Botanic they planted Gardens. as a, as a um... No one seems to plant them. Yeah, I don't know why they would have been planted. It's not I know why. I know where these tree. came from yeah. locally. I don't want to name names, but they came from Swarthmore College. Oh, really? Uh, so there, there's two big, <laughs> there's two big amber cork trees that have been there for years mm -hmm. and have seeded all into the forest. How big around do they get? Oh, massive, like oh, ten feet wide. Yeah, and Whoa. but they won't get super tall. They'll spread out more, say like a medium-sized tree. Um, but these are fun to cut down. They ruin your tools and everything. I have literally, I have cut down hundreds in Philadelphia and mm -hmm. in Swarthmore alone, hundreds. Mm -hmm. So this is one of many emerging invasives coming from Philadelphia, heading in all directions except for east, pretty much. Mm -hmm. um, so these are good to cut down as soon as possible. They will re-sprout. Um, this is one of, this like Japanese knotweed and a couple other plants that are really bad have really strong medicinal uses and there is yeah. value in it. It's not really practical to be cutting down all the Japanese barberries and harvesting them for berberine, but a tree is. I just want people to know these, but it's really only practi practical for a really knowledgeable right. um, homesteader or small farmer like myself. Right. It's practical for almost nobody else. So we should just cut them down, but learn that we have awesome native plants and other things that have right. berberine in it too. Right. And I always try to mention herbalism a bit because I get really crazy questions from people. They'll say like, but herbs can't be used to prevent anything, right? Or they can't be used for serious treatments. Oh. And like, they can be used for everything that's ever existed yeah. and better than everything else. And all those pharmaceutical drugs, 60% of them about come from plants anyway. Yeah. So it'll help you learn about the medicine you're, you might already be taking that isn't a plant, you know? Oh yeah. So the walnuts I like to point out because the black walnuts will grow wherever the squirrels put them. But these two black walnuts are really indicative, uh, and even those out there are really the, the ones that are actually ash trees. These black walnuts and white ashes are growing exactly where they would in a floodplain. And the easiest place to see that is to drive uh, anywhere into Chester County, especially Southern Chester County. And between all the big farm fields are pretty much this scene, invasive shrubs, and black walnut and white ash in the in the creeks that divide the farm divide the farms. Are the black walnuts considered invasive or non No, it's native and I make the argument that it is the absolute most under harvested native fruit period. Mm -hmm. um, in the 1920s, confectionery generally speaking was black walnut, you know, and they're hard to get that? the fruit out of though, right? Is that yeah. the one reason? Well, you stay in your hands doing it. Well, your hands will get this yeah, ugly yellowy black. brown color. <laughs> so you got to do it with gloves on and you got to get, you got to remove the husk and just like get into it. Yeah. But then you can eat them, but break them apart and everything. But the point is these are all over the ground in the yes. fall. Yep. And it's great watching squirrels like run around with them. It's funny. All the nuts are tough nuts to crack. Right. Yeah. That's why people don't pick up hickory nuts. Right. Because you got to drive them over with your car, with car or right. something. Or like. <laughs> Sledgehammer. Yeah. Yeah. So our sycamore, I should have talked about because it's in a 
family all of its own. There's a couple sycamores in like Arizona and Texas, but for, it's pretty much all alone here. Uh, allegedly, according to the botany books, its closest relative is like the lo American lotus, the next native plant. Really? Wow. It's in the plain, plain tree family, as is the lotus, and no other trees are. Yeah. So it doesn't make sense to me, and it's one of those examples uh, where I don't just blindly trust phylogeny and taxonomy. But uh, who knows? I work. I happen to work at a place this past year, a farm that has the second biggest sycamore in Pennsylvania. Mm. And it's the biggest tree I've ever seen in my life. Wow. It's like not even any question. I haven't traveled much, but it's the biggest tree. And all of the biggest trees in Pennsylvania are sycamores. Like the top 12 are, the, you know, mm. and maybe a pine here or there. But out by me, they grow by the springs. They have, uh, everything about them is weird. The name sycamore is weird. Sycamore in the Bible refers basically to mulberries and figs, it's in, which are in the mulberry family. Mm -hmm. So you'll see it written sycamorous with a K, sycamorous mm -hmm. fig. Mm -hmm. So it's a name that applies to the fig and mulberry family and somehow got attached to the American buttonwood. The buttonwood's name for the, the button balls, which were like, you'd have on your coat, you know? It's, I don't know old terminology very well. I'm doing my best <laughs> as I'm looking at people who might know the term, uh -huh. but button ball, you know, you yeah. sell those little coats with the button balls. So that's yeah. what it's named for. So I don't know where the name Sycamore came from. Mm. Um, it's just a weird one that see, it seems to grow. It seems to live longer than any of our other trees. I would say right up there with the Eastern white pine, the hemlock and the white oak. They're probably the four that'll live the, the longest. And then there's a few other black gums actually up there too, you know, 400 years or so. Yeah. But the sycamores I know are the ones at the mill at Anselma. If you go there, they're 280 years old. Wow. And the one I know, um, probably not over 300. I don't know if there's anything over 300 years old, really. Phreatophyte is a term for species that are really uh, <coughs> deep rooted. It kind of means well plant from a Greek term. Okay. Uh, and the white oak and the sycamore, deep soils, bottom lands, they are free out of fight. So allegedly the roots can go 100 feet deep. Wow. But when they tip over, you only see two feet of it. Yeah. So, right? So who really knows? Who knows? Right. Yeah. This is the white mulberry. White mulberry named for what the fruit looks like before it turns black. Mm -hmm as opposed to the black mulberry, which also turns black. And the red mulberry which is kind of black. <laughs> so the red mulberry, Morris rubra, is our native species. And it's just like a bird powerhouse. There's like over 40 different birds that can eat the fruit. And the, our Morris alba, the white mulberry, is invasive. But it's literally one of the most sacred trees to people in the entire world. Like most sacred of all time like to the entire Middle East. Um, so it's been planted everywhere. It's kind of well known to have been introduced in, into New York State as like part of a failed silk moth endeavor multiple times in colonial times. And that's apparently where they came from. They were even planted at large scale in certain places like Arkansas, where they're still persist, persisting to today. And the reason I talk about the mulberry is because at this point, there's not much difference between the red mulberry and the black, the white mulberry because they interbreed. So if there were native red mulberries around here, you really wouldn't even be able to tell them apart unless you got them from a nursery. So um, if you get out a little bit more west into the country away from the coast, you'll see red mulberries. But it's got awesome wood, it's got awesome fruit. And in Chinese medicine, the, the root bark, the leaves and the fruit are all different herbs. Um, and I only know about the fruit, basically. So my question about this is like, how, how dare we label the white mulberry invasive in a way, you know? It's provided food for humans for millennia, but that's not a criteria for what the government decides is an invasive species. The criteria is if it causes ecological or economic harm or both regardless of um, any ecological or economic good that any of these plants do. Yeah. And so I'm totally on board with planting red mulberries everywhere. 
and they're small trees. The birds love them. They don't grow too fast. This is, the reason this is a weed, if you've ever been to DC, you'll see white mulberries everywhere, a little further south. They're all over the place. They just come up everywhere. But the red mulberry is slow. It takes like five years for you to grow them to like a good height, and then they just take off. We just planted one. In our oh, last awesome. Planting. Yep. Yeah. And, and so, generally near water, or that's just... No, they're anyone? more just normal wet, normal water regime. But the one thing I'll say is that they're like maybe dioecious. They might be male and female. Uh, nobody seems to know. Botanists aren't supposed to tell you that, but I've read a lot of conflicting info. And so up there where the fence is uh, that blocks the road, right on the other side, there's two mulberries. And one of them makes a ton of fruit. We, Chris and I have like cleaned up over there. Yep. So I don't hate on this tree at all anymore, even though it's really hard to cut with a saw. They grow all crazy. They're difficult to prune. They don't always produce fruit, and everyone thinks they're invasive. <laughs> well, we, we, so I didn't sell it to you there. And they then stain I, your car, right? And they, yeah, they make a mess. We but it's our a, earliest fruit. Yeah. It's our earliest fruit That's with the important. service berries. Right, yeah. Yeah, in June. Is, is, was it the muskrat? What did we have growing? Yeah, but there's a muskrat. We, we yeah. had a muskrat living under here. So he had his food source and his little den and his shade all in one, one tree. Yeah. It was, was kind of awesome. cool. And I didn't talk about agriculture, but like, if you have pigs or hogs, you should have mulberries. Mm -hmm. If you have any animals in the summer that need to eat, you should have mulberries. Because it's a mass, it's a mast, it's soft mast that comes in June. Mm -hmm. You know, where most of your big animals, you kind of have to supply them with food until right. the acorns fall and stuff like right. that. Like, so. Thank you for everybody for coming. We had a great time. Great. I wanted. It was yeah. wonderful. Honestly, the past five years of my life was like the best education I ever had. Because mm -hmm. I'd already been a professional gardener. I'd already done ecological restoration. Mm -hmm. But to have a homestead, sure. you get to learn it That's all. Exciting. You get to you get to make all of these decisions and yeah. do it all yourself. And Amazing. Uh, yeah. Make all the mistakes fun. and yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, they're more in the house. The outside is fun. <laughs> <laughs> the house is the issue. Yeah. So thank you for having me.